Hello, everyone, uh, and uh, good afternoon, uh, Europe, uh, good morning, US, uh, and good evening, uh, uh, Middle East. Uh, and uh, today, it's a pleasure to present the ninth episode of uh, Vascopedia uh, Views uh, Fan Pop Edition. And today, we have uh, two very uh, known colleagues of uh, us uh, with, uh, uh, with us uh, to present uh, uh, about a very important, a very challenging, a very interesting topic, which is uh, our daily battle against calcium. So it's an intravascular litotripsy uh, the solution and uh, today we're gonna of course uh, uh, share some data but mainly some cases for our experience and to try to understand which lesions are better uh, better uh, treated with uh, this uh, new and very exciting technology and uh, you know I don't want to spend too much time I just want to remember you that Vascopedia Views as usual is very interactive uh, um, symposium so we're gonna have some polls during the uh, presentations and we're gonna ask your opinion so if you're going through uh, uh, the presentation via your phone I will ask you to come out from uh, the full uh, screen view in order to be able to see the question and to vote because your vote is extremely important so uh, I wouldn't uh, uh, you know of course uh, spend uh, much time else and then you know again you know I didn't say the names of our co speakers so is uh, one is uh, from uh, Germany Konstantinos Stravoulakis and uh, the other one is Narayan Tulazidazan uh, from uh, UK so from London too and uh, essentially, uh, today we're going to start uh, with, uh, with uh, you know, it's a very, it would be a very dynamic also episode with all the three of us speaking and trying to, uh, you know, overlap our data uh, together. So let me start then with a little introduction about uh, what uh, the episode today is and you know as you as you have seen and you know uh, the you know we are quite successful now in this kind of new era with uh, uh, some more interaction uh, via web and i would like to start straight away with the poll and uh, the poll is a very simple a very simple question very simple answer i want you to uh, tell us is uh, do you use ivl in our daily in your daily practice and the answer number one is yes and answer number two is no very simple question and then, you know, I will uh, uh, let uh, uh, then uh, um, Narayan to continue with uh, a little bit of overview over the technology. That's fantastic. Uh, thank you very much for that, Lorenzo. And thank you for the uh, introduction. I hope you're all uh, voting. This slide is just to illustrate some of the common problems that we can uh, see when we're trying to treat calcium in the femoral popliteal segment. Um, it's not just a matter of, of problems affecting procedural success, but it's also complications. And then when you have a complication, you may need further devices to, to fix these complications and then your device cost mounts up, uh, the risks of the patient mounts up. So the first uh, problem that we can see with calcium is the issue with dissection. Calcified lesions are significantly more likely to dissect when treated with plain balloon angioplasty. Uh, and these dissections can act as a focus of restenosis in the future, as well as being flow limiting on the table that day. Uh, it's also quite possible for uh, calcified lesions to perforate when treated with, uh, with, with plain PTA. Often we try with plain PTA and we don't get a good result and then we go with high pressure PTA on a calcified lesion and that's when the perforations happen. When we try and use uh, atherectomy, for example, in order to, uh, to, to treat these calcified lesions, there is always the problem of distal embolization. We can, we can try and mitigate that by using filters, uh, being very careful with the way we use the atherectomy device. But I always say to people that whenever I start an atherectomy case, I'm putting the patient on the table, being fully prepared to go and have to do some thromboembolectomy uh, if there is trash during the, uh, during the atherectomy running. Um, if we end up with a sub suboptimal uh, result after angioplasty or atherectomy, then the, the likelihood of having to place a stent in calcified lesions is significantly higher. Uh, and when those stents are placed in lesions that haven't been prepared properly, it's very common to get stent crushing or inadequate stent expansion. And this is a problem that's very difficult to treat, as we'll see later. If we decide to treat without a stent, then the risk of early or sort of acute or subacute vessel recoil uh, is, is very, very common in calcified lesions. The final area where calcium can give us trouble is when we're actually trying to establish iliac access to deliver large bore devices to the aorta. So for example, for endovascular aneurysm repair to deliver those big devices, sort of 18, 20 French sheaths, or for, uh, for uh, transcatheter aortic valve repair to have sheaths, you need at least 18, 20 French to get the device up. And uh, this is something where calcium can, can really be a problem, uh, but we don't want to stent the patient. 
just to show you a little bit about how the technology works, I'm just going to play here a video which demonstrates the shockwave technology and demonstrates the kit in action. So it has a control unit which is connected to the shockwave balloon by a cable. Uh, and this is a shockwave balloon inflated across the calcified lesions. And you can see here these emitters are emitting one pulse of lithotripsy every second and causing these microfractures in the calcium here. Uh, and this picture shows nicely why it's very important to oversize the shockwave balloon according to the vessel because we we want it to get a nice apposition to the vessel wall all the way along this undulating calcium segment here so that's why it's important to have that little bit of oversize and as the lithotripsy as the lithotripsy pulses cause these cracks in the calcium the compliance of the vessel changes and the vessel opens up slowly uh, under, under just the same pressure in the balloon because the compliance of the vessel has been chained by cracking the calcium. This is a, a micro CT image to prove what's actually happening with the IVL technology. This image on, on the left here is a micro CT scan image of some calcium. And this on the right, you can see after IVL treatment, these micro fractures have come in many different planes throughout the calcium. And that's what's changed the compliance of the vessel. Just two quick things to note in terms of technique. Optimal technique is very important. And this was shown by the Disrupt PAD2 trial, that two things we need to be careful to do is one, to make sure we get that oversize of 10% to the reference vessel diameter to make sure that we've got full apposition of the balloon to the vessel wall. Um, and the second thing is to make sure that we overlap emitters when we're treating longer lesions, because the most proximal and most distal markers you can see on the balloon are not emitters, they're just markers. So you have to make sure that as this picture shows here, that if you're treating a long lesion, you're going to use overlapping balloons. You need to make sure that the markers are separated by not more than one centimetres, which means that actually having two visible markers overlap to ensure therapeutic coverage. So now I'd like to just hand over to, uh, to Costas, uh, who's going to talk you through a little bit more, some more of the latest data for the shockwave technology. So, um, well, uh, the software device was evaluated in the framework of uh, many clinical trials, and I would like to uh, show you the most uh, interesting one from my point of view uh, regarding the femoroclital segment was the Disrupt PAD3 trial, which um, randomized patients uh, in a multi-center uh, single uh, blind uh, control trial uh, between IVL and PTA for patients with moderate uh, to severe calcium uh, de novo femoral lesions. Uh, 306 uh, patients were randomized in 45 uh, sites. And as I said before, patients were randomized prior to uh, DCB angioplasty, uh, either to IVL or PTA. Uh, we're waiting, of course, for the long term results. Uh, the patients will be followed for uh, at least uh, two years in an interval of six months. We have 30 days follow up, six months, one year, and two years. Um, and uh, the main uh, endpoint of the study was procedural success defined as uh, uh, stenosis less than 30% without uh, flow limiting uh, dissection. Uh, secondary uh, endpoint was the major adverse events, uh, clinical driven TLR, uh, ABI measurements, and so on. Uh, and the powered secondary endpoint at 12 months was the primary uh, patency as it was assessed with the duplex ultrasound scanning. Um, it's very important that uh, also from the first, from the acute results, uh, we see uh, that the IVL can be a very valuable tool for the treatment of uh, severely calcified vessels. Uh, both the site um, uh, observations as, uh, as well as the angiographic core lab evaluation showed that uh, we have a significantly, a statistically significant higher uh, procedural success uh, following IVL. Uh, compared to PTA alone. And to be honest, this is something that we expect. We know that uh, when we treat uh, calcified vessels with just uh, plain old balloon angioplasty, um, most of the vessels will not uh, respond, um, meaning that uh, we have a significant recoil or uh, recent noses or even significant uh, flow limiting uh, dissection. The, um, the most important part of the IVL is that you don't need the, the, such an aggressive uh, treatment uh, but uh, the shock waves uh, the, can really uh, modify the calcium uh, part of the plaque, can really change uh, the compliance of the vessel wall. And this was shown also in uh, various uh, observations of the 30 days outcomes. Uh, for, uh, we, uh, in many patients, uh, we need lower pressure to achieve better results with the IVL. 
uh, as I said before, we activate the um, uh, the uh, shock uh, the shock wave cutter at four atmospheres. We can go up to six atmosphere, but it's less significantly less than a uh, normal PTA, where sometimes we have to go up to 20 or 24 atmospheres uh, to crack uh, the calcified uh, plug. Uh, important things, especially in the days of leaving nothing behind, that we have a 75% reduction in, pro in provisional stent placement uh, and 69% uh, less um, post-dilation. Um, the most, at least my eyes, the most important finding was that uh, in the IVL group, we have a 77% less uh, dissection, uh, less uh, flow-limiting dissections compared uh, with a plain old balloon angioplasty. Um, but it's not only that uh, the shockwave was evaluated, the shockwave catheter, the M5 catheter was evaluated in the, in the framework of a prospective uh, randomized trial. We also have the data from the observational registry and uh, where we have patients uh, with everyday calcium uh, not the one that are highly selected for uh, uh, for randomized controlled trial, and we see also con a consistent finding that, uh, regardless if the patient is um, uh, is treated in the framework of the RCT or uh, in the observation registry, we see that the, the risk uh, for complications very low, uh, and also have a very good um, acute results. And this is something that we have to keep in mind: that patients that are calcified more of them, uh, the majority of them are patients that um, are patients with a chronic kidney disease, diabetics, and so on. Uh, and the com a complication in this case can be devastating. So it's not only about the treatment, the efficacy regarding the treatment, but also the safety of the patient. I think that uh, this is where uh, the IVL strategy makes a difference. Um, for sure, we have many treatment options. Uh, IVL is not the, uh, the only one. Uh, we have different types of atherectomy. We have also space, specialty balloons. Uh, but uh, we have to keep in mind that these uh, procedures are most of the time, um, in most cases, time consuming. Uh, we need um, uh, repeat angiograms. Uh, we have prolonged procedures. And uh, also, these strategies mainly target uh, the intimal calcium and not. Uh, the uh, and not uh, the, the the media calcification, uh, and this is an example of what um, uh, what can go wrong when you use um, a normal um, treatment strategies. This is a patient with CLTI. We see this uh, long SFA occlusion, heavily calcified, uh, and the very bad runoff. Um, we went for anti-grade retrograde recanalization because anti-grade crossing was not possible. Perform plain old balloon angioplasty. Uh, with a short balloon, afterwards with a longer one, and you see that in the in the in the in the calcified plaque of, uh, or part of the plaque, uh, the vessel didn't open. So uh, we used the scoring balloon uh, to try to modify the plaque, and afterwards uh, went for a uh, stent deployment with a um, nice angiographic result. But the patient came again with the worsening of symptoms, performed CTA, uh, CT scan, and you see that in the most calcified part of the plaque, we have a crash of the, of the deployed stent uh, with a 70% stenosis. And this is something that's very difficult to treat now because you already have this, the, the stent inside. It's very difficult to uh, treat an under-deployed an under, uh, uh, scaffold. So what we have to keep in mind, unfortunately, is that traditional modalities uh, in uh, treating calcium often fail. So I, I will, uh, Lorenzo will take over now. Yes, thank you, Costas. And uh, essentially, it's very important to see what you have said because it's uh, in my case, essentially, it's all about the treatment and the safety for this patient. This patient, as you can see from the screen, is a quite uh, young patient, 47 year old, with an ulcer or necrotic second toe. The patient was on dialysis and uh, was diabetic, so it's one of the most uh, challenging patients you can find, uh, you know, in your in your scenario. It's the, the worst of the CLI. And you can see from uh, the CT scan, you can see how much calcium there is in the, in uh, his arteries. Essentially, you can see that the calcium sometimes breaks and at the break uh, uh, you know the, the broken calcium creates a sort of stenosis in the, this uh, uh, SFA and there was also some uh, more disease below the knee as only the single vessel via DAT you will see in the andrograms. So you can see here how the lesions uh, presents uh, uh, in uh, during the androgram you can see how stenotic uh, the uh, lesions are making the vessel here very calcified at the level of the mid distal SFA at the level of the hunter canal and uh, at the level of the popliteal. Essentially in 
a case like this with then a single vessel runoff, you can see there's a, it looks like there's an anterior tibia and a peroneal, but mainly the flow to the foot is brought uh, via an occluded anterior tibial artery. So, um, you know, the single vessel, extremely calcified, extremely young patient is, I think this was the perfect case uh, for uh, shockwave. But I want to ask you, uh, what, how would you treat that in your experience? Uh, there are different, of course, uh, tools, uh, the, as Costa said, there's a PTA, there could be high pressure PTA, specialty PTA, like any kind of high pressure balloon or scoring balloon, atherectomy, or, you know, the intravascular lithotripsy we're talking about today. And essentially, we would really like you to vote and to be uh, very honest with us, because at the end of the presentation, we're going to discuss the results. And we're going to have a little bit of, you know, discussion, like being on a sofa and, uh, you know, discussing uh, in front of a beer in a Congress, for example. So this is what I did. Uh, I tried to cross with the uh, IVL balloon, but essentially it was so tight that I couldn't cross. So something which is very useful, you can see the amount of calcium in these arteries, is to cross with, a, of course, a a smaller balloon, like a three millimeter balloon. And after that, I was finally able to advance this seven millimeter balloon. And always remember that the size is important. You know, the vessel, uh, the balloon is inflated, as we said before, not a very high pressure. So it's not like the trauma to the vessel, like a normal balloon, but the balloon needs to adhere to the uh, walls uh, of uh, the artery. So you can see how the balloon is uh, like a snake inside there. And after, you know, I inflated the balloon, of course, uh, at the level of the Hunter Canal, always the seven millimeter balloon. And then at the level of the popliteal, you know, very gentle inflation just to touch the vessel walls. And then I, I inflated a six millimeter balloon. You can see the final result with no stenting and actually with a very uh, quick treatment, I had the vessel completely recanalized. You can see, of course, there's no uh, trash. And of course, I had to recanalize also the distal anterior tibial artery, which was a vessel very similar to uh, the SFA, so extremely calcific. And I would say that if I had uh, a shockwave balloon to treat this last segment of the vessel, I would have used. We're waiting for smaller balloons now. There are, of course, five, six, and seven for the SFA and the Alex, but also the smaller ones are on the market. And we're going to, you know, we're looking forward to even smaller to treat very distal, dorsalis pedis, extremely calcific vessels, like in this case. Uh, you know, it's not just about angiographic uh, uh, result. Uh, despite I'm a radiologist, I like to take care uh, of my patients, you can see after uh, like uh, four months, uh, the patient had completely healed uh, at the level of the second toe, which then uh, of course was amputated and nicely healed. And then, you know, uh, now it's uh, it's turn to pass uh, the microphone uh, again. And, uh, you know, it's it's time for uh, um, uh, Costas, uh, sorry, Nalayan again uh, to show some of, of his cases. Uh, thank you very much. Sorry, I had a little, uh, a little technical issue there. Um, so hopefully you can all see my uh, see my screen now. Uh, this case is a 64 year old lady with uh, critical limb ischemia. She has uh, rest pain and tissue loss, Rutherford five, and she'd had a right common femoral endarterectomy uh, and a patch repair uh, about sort of three or four months before this procedure. Uh, and at the same time as doing the endarterectomy and patch repair, the surgeon had done uh, angioplasty of this proximal popliteal lesion here. Um, the problem was that the, after this procedure, despite the multi-level revascularization, the patient had continuing rest pain and a non-healing ulcer. And actually her clinical course was complicated by admission to the local hospital with pulmonary edema. So she was not the very fit and you could tell that she wouldn't be suitable for an extended procedure. So these are the images from the first procedure. And now I'll move on to show you the, uh, the, the next procedure, next images from the, our, uh, our attempt with intravascular lithotripsy. So this is the first angiogram that we can, we can see we've performed. And you can see there's been very early restenosis here. Um, the, this level where you can see the dense calcium here on the, uh, on the plain x-ray, uh, that, that has recoiled either acutely or subacutely. Uh, and this has caused her symptoms not to improve. Uh, I quite like using IVUS when we use intravascular lithotripsy for helping vessel sizing. And this is the IVUS runs here. And you can see there's some quite dense calcium, particularly lower down, and then some softer plaque further up here. I'll just quickly run that IVUS image again, uh, just to show the dense calcium causing stenosis here at the P1 level. Um, and then as we move back into the distal SFA, there's some more soft plug. Just to look at some, uh, some IVUS images in more detail, you can see the IVUS gives you a really exact way of doing the vessel sizing. So that here, this is probably about actually maybe 5.4 millimeters. So we choose to oversize by 10% and go with a six, um, six millimeter shockwave balloon. And this is just 
not to look at the sizes, but just to outline how you see the calcium on IBIS and how you can tell how much of a lumen diameter and then use it to assess your lumen gain after the procedure. So this is the images we've all become very familiar with seeing. You can see the shockwave balloon inflated first to a nominal pressure and we, we accept that it doesn't open out to its full diameter. All we're trying to do is to get a position of the balloon with the vessel wall and then over several cycles of balloon inflation, the shockwave balloon slowly expands and then we finish off with a plain balloon angioplasty to the nominal diameter and also a DCB. And just to play through the final IBIS result here, you'll see there is still some stenosis, but there's a significant improvement uh, in the um, in the calcium particularly. There's just actually a small dissection here in the non-calcified part. If for those sharp-eyed one of you would have seen near the end of that little IVUS run that there's a little dissection in the soft plaque, but none of the calcific plaque has actually dissected. And this next image, IVUS image here <coughs> shows the luminal gain achieved. This was the part that was the tightest on the pre-shockwave IVUS, and this is how that same part looks on the post-shockwave IVUS. So we've achieved significant luminal gain and a good angiographic result with no obvious dissection. This is just to show uh, another case. Uh, this is an 85 year old male patient with critical limb ischemia who'd had previous distal transmetatarsal amputation several years before at a different hospital. Uh, and he'd been fine for several years, but then presented to us again with left foot rest pain and tissue loss in his heel and in the stump of his left transmetatarsal amputation. Past medical history, all diabetes, ischemic heart disease and chronic kidney disease stage four. So you can see risk factors for calcium there. And we didn't have a CT scan to plan for this because he had CKD4. So we plan to do the case just using minimal iodinated contrast. We use less than 40 mils and mostly intravascular ultrasound. Uh, we came up and over for this case because we couldn't actually see the left common femoral artery lumen on ultrasound to get antegrade access because there was so much calcium, as you can see here from this uh, iliac angiogram that should be playing on your screen. So these are the uh, femoral popliteal angios. Uh, you can see there's densely calcified stenosis in the common femoral artery. There's a densely calcified occlusion of the distal SFA and uh, proximal popliteal artery. And we get some right reconstitution in the P P2, P3 segment uh, with the PT providing the single vessel runoff down to the foot. And again, just to look at the IVUS imaging, you can see there, this is what the occluded segment in the popliteal looks like in IVUS with these dense rocks of calcium. Um, and the IVUS actually gives you a good idea again of where the calcium is so that you can use your shockwave cycles appropriately uh, and to give an accurate vessel diameter. We, it was a difficult uh, occlusion to cross. We had to use CTO wires. And it's important to mention here that the shockwave uh, balloons, it's over an 014 wire. And so occasionally you do need to predilate the track to be able to deliver the shockwave balloon. So I always try and do a stepwise predilation, starting with 2.5 millimeters and then go up every 0.5 millimeters until I get to the size that we can deliver the shockwave balloon. Uh, and this means by using a small vessel, small diameter balloon for your predilation, you're less likely to cause any dissection because, again, the whole point of using the shockwave is that you're trying to avoid dissection in this scenario. So once we've predilated the tract, we've got some idea of the vessel size and we've selected appropriate balloons. You can see some images here of the shockwave balloons being inflated across the lesion. And again, that picture where you start off and inflate it and you see some compression of the balloon, allow the shockwave cycles to go on, be patient, you'll see some cavitation with the balloon and then the balloon will slowly open out and you'll be able to do a good plain old balloon angioplasty and get a significantly improved luminal gain. We had a little bit of residual calcium in the common femoral artery, but you can see on the uh, on the next run that we've established flow through the fempop segment, really brisk flow, no evidence of dissection, really brisk flow with no trash down the PT. I would, if, if it had used atherectomy in this case, I really wouldn't have fancied having to go down that single vessel runoff trying to pick up a little piece of trash. So this is the IVUS afterwards. Again, you can see that there's been significant luminal gain from that uh, from the from the preoperative angio just in that distal in that popliteal segment uh, and as uh, uh, as Costas was saying earlier in these patients there's been no trash no complications but these patients are generally very high high at risk of, of, of these type of complications so now I'll uh, I'll, I'll hand back over uh, to uh, to Costas if you'd like to continue showing your cases He's muted again. Probably he's not interested Sorry, to share his message. I, I, <laughs> I have, I have to mute him, which is uh, quite uh, 
Pues, uh, sorry. So uh, when I see these angiograms, I, I, I always uh, think how, how it's possible to have such calcified disease. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's always amazing and what nowadays you can treat uh, with modern devices. So um, uh, this is uh, an, another case where uh, shockwave, uh, the intravascular lithotripsy uh, was uh, very helpful for the treatment of a heavily calcified disease. We have a patient with a, a critical limb, uh, uh, ischemia, uh, diabetic food syndrome, we see this significant stenosis uh, in Hunter uh, uh, channel, and uh, of course, we have a single vessel runoff uh, as uh, usual in these cases uh, from the posterior tibial. Um, in this case, I went also for an uh, IVUS uh, plaque uh, evaluation uh, for two reasons. First of all, to perform the sizing, uh, and secondly, to better uh, appreciate the luminal gain, uh, because in this case, I uh, would like to avoid uh, placing a scaffold um, I would prefer to go for uh, for a leave nothing behind strategy. And I think in this case, is, uh, IVUS guidance is important. As you see now, I'm performing also the measurements uh, of the vessel diameter in order to uh, choose my shockwave catheter. Keep in mind that oversizing and uh, in overlapping are the two uh, parameters that are very, very important for the success of the uh, IVL. So uh, after crossing the lesion uh, from I was run, uh, uh, did the measurements, and then uh, in this case, I think I predilated with a, uh, with um, a, so, um, an undersized ballooning just to allow the, uh, the shockwave catheter to come through this uh, tight stenosis. And then, as you see, uh, we um, are uh, uh, we are uh, performing IVL uh, intravascular lithotripsy from uh, the um, uh, from the P2 segment up uh, to uh, the distal um, SFA, uh, afterwards uh, drug code balloon angioplasty as anti uh, therapy. Uh, to be honest, I tend to use the shockwave catheter as a vessel prep device in my, in my practice, uh, at least for the SFA, uh, popliteal artery and the common femoral. Um, that's why I combine with anti therapy. This is not always a DCB, uh, but could be a scaffold depending on the lesion. Afterwards, uh, when for, uh, for an IVUS run, uh, important to identify any uh, dissection uh, to uh, see if we have any recoil. And as you see, we have, of course, uh, not the, uh, the, the smooth lumen that we see after uh, a stent deployment, but still, I will have a very good uh, luminal gain. Uh, so uh, I was uh, very happy with, the, uh, with uh, this uh, result. Uh, and then uh, performing uh, angiograms again uh, to uh, assess the patency uh, of the of the vessel. As you see, we have both in IVUS and uh, in the angiographic assessment, a very good luminal gain. Uh, and this is important, especially in these cases, that despite uh, we uh, treat a very challenging uh, calcified disease, we don't have a significant risk for dissection or distal embolization, uh, which in this case will compromise also uh, the uh, limb uh, salvage. Um, and then uh, this is another uh, very interesting uh, um, uh, case. So we have a patient with the two prior failed uh, cruel um, uh, femoral posterior bypasses. The patient doesn't have any vein. And as you see in the uh, left-hand side, we have very calcified disease from the origin of the SFA, uh, short popliteal occlusion and uh, a single vessel runoff from the posterior tibial artery. And it's important to see that um, on the, uh, the right-hand side, that uh, even the wounds from the uh, bypass from the um, from grafting uh, didn't uh, heal. The patient came uh, with rest pain. Actually, uh, she after the two failed uh, grafts, uh, she was planned for a major amputation uh, in a, in a small non CLI uh, unit, and she came for, to us for a se second opinion. Uh, Recanalization wasn't that um, uh, that easy. Uh, of course, when you have to cross these uh, severely calcified lesions, uh, you need a plan B, and uh, most of the cases, at least in our cath lab, is a retrograde access, uh, puncture of the posterior tibial artery, and then a cross from retrograde, uh, performed a predilation with um, uh, uh, with a undersized balloon catheter, and then went for uh, 6 by 60 uh, shockwave balloon uh, uh, angioplasty. Uh, and as you see in the middle uh, of the screen, we have a very good uh, luminal gain, uh, and we could establish flow in the femoral pital segment. Uh, again, went for a drug code balloon angioplasty from the P2 segment uh, up to the groin, uh, and um, uh, we had to, uh, to deploy also uh, two uh, short stents 
uh, to drug looting stints uh, to cover uh, erystenosis after the combined treatment. Um, it's I don't see it really like, like a failure of the leave nothing behind concept because uh, the alternative would be a scaffold from the uh, below the nipopletal artery up to the groin. Uh, instead, in this case, we're able to uh, recanalize the, this uh, heavily calcified vessel. Uh, for the majority of the plaque, uh, went for a leave nothing behind uh, strategy and just a place to drug looting stents uh, to uh, to secure the flow uh, to the uh, to the foot. Afterwards, recanalized uh, the um, uh, or uh, crossed. Uh, the posterior tibial uh, stenosis and the TP trunk uh, went for a drug eluting stem deployment, the TP trunk, and uh, as you see, after the ballooning of the posterior tibial, have a very nice uh, flow to the foot. And uh, it, I'm, I'm really happy about this case because, as I said before, this patient was planned uh, for a major amputation and surgery failed uh, twice. Uh, and it's important, and these are the cases that uh, really matter, uh, the case where we can uh, save a limb uh, using a new uh, technologies. And I'm going back. That's great. Thank you very much, Costas. Um, so as, as, as Costas was saying, these, uh, the, these cases where we can really save a limb are the ones that really give, give the most gratification for us and for the patient. This is a 78-year-old male, um, Rutherford 6. He'd had a right common femoral and arterectomy and patch repair uh, and a right common iliac artery stent and also had some toes debrided. But within a week, he was still having rest pain and die back of the wound. So this is someone, a patient who can very quickly progress to having a, a baloney amputation. Um, so... So this was one case where it's very important to uh, to get a good result and establish inline flow to the foot. Uh, again, I've come up and over because his right groin was just uh, literally uh, just over a week out from the surgery. And again, you see the similar picture of very, very heavy femoropopliteal calcium. Again, needed a CTO wire to cross pre-dilation to deliver the shockwave balloon. Um, uh, and then once we've got the shockwave balloon in situ, that familiar picture, uh, getting luminal gain each with each cycle of shockwave, a plain old balloon angioplasty. We had to do a little bit of uh, stent reconstruction of the, uh, of the, of the tibial trifecta as well um, and then finally applied a DCB uh, and also decided to use a scaffold in this case and I think that's something where we're looking to need more data as to which cases we need to use a scaffold and which we don't but as you can see here the final result was was very very pleasing indeed. So just to uh, move on to another poll, uh, after seeing maybe what you've seen today or your own experiences of shockwave, just to be very interesting to see how everyone sees the main application of IVL in the femoropopliteal segment going forward. Do you see it one as IVL for as a standalone therapy? Do you think it's going to be number two, IVL plus a DCB as anti resonotic therapy? Or do you see yourself mostly using IVL? Number three, IVL as a, as a vessel preparation to place a stent. So please do take the time to vote on that now. And in that time, I'll also hand back to Costas. So uh, and now, you know, the most uh, uh, tough part for, uh, for a surgeon, you know, they're talking about uh, endovascular treatment of uh, common femoral uh, artery disease. Um, well, to be, to be honest, there is, for at least till now, the common femoral artery disease like uh, the, the left main stenosis of the peripheral. There is no question that uh, till now, uh, uh, surgical therapy is a gold standard because we have primary patency rates of uh, 96% at seven years. Uh, but still, everybody uh, has patients that um, uh, are not uh, fit or uh, for an open repair, or at least they are very high risk patients where we really need an alternative to surgery. Uh, and in this case, I think that uh, in heavily calcified disease, the um, Sokov catheter uh, can be an important uh, alternative. Um, when you know, when I was a resident, I think uh, most of the surgeons uh, think that uh, in a common femoral artery and arterectomy, and I repeat myself, this is the gold standard for common femoral disease. Uh, it, it is uh, many surgeons think that it's a straightforward procedure, but when we see the the data, uh, the Medicare data published some years ago, we see that the combined uh, mortality and mobility reaches uh, is 15 percent, and 10 percent of the patients will go uh, repeated um, operation uh, at 30 days. And we have many risk factors like age, uh, patients with COPD or uh, end-stage disease, uh, which might 
uh, big candidates for an, um, uh, for an endovascular treatment. And we should uh, keep in mind that uh, the current uh, CLTI guideline, guideline suggests against the use of a, a scaffold in the common femoral. Um, any, anyhow, um, um, this is why I think that uh, the, the IVL might be a very uh, beneficial uh, solution for uh, these uh, patients. So when we see the data from uh, the observational registry about the common femoral artery, we still see uh, that we have a very good luminal gain uh, with uh, uh, reaching uh, the, uh, achieving a 25% uh, final stenosis after the treatment of uh, the common femoral artery disease. And we see uh, that in many uh, published uh, data, in many published studies, uh, the risk of uh, complication is not uh, that high. Uh, actually, in the common femoral artery, we didn't uh, see any complication uh, in the observational uh, register with no dissections or uh, perforation mm -hmm. distal embolizations. Uh, I think that the majority of the physicians are reluctant to treat uh, the common femoral with um, uh, endovascular by endovascular means. Uh, be, be, because they're concerned about the risk for a uh, high-grade dissection or about losing the deep femoral. Uh, but at least the data that we have nowadays showing that Shockwave uh, is uh, at least a safe uh, option. And I would like to show you a case from our cath lab uh, with a common femoral artery disease. In this case, a very focal uh, high calcified disease. The patient refused an open uh, repair, which uh, was our first plan. And uh, it's a patient with a diabetic foot syndrome. And in this case, I went also for an IVUS run. The reason is that in the posterior wall, uh, it's, it might be difficult to appreciate the, uh, the, the, um, the disease burden. So an IVUS and intraluminal imaging by, might be very beneficial. A problem with the common femoral artery disease is the, the, the biggest uh, shockwave catheter is seven millimeters. So it might not be possible uh, to oversize the catheter and in most of the cases is not possible. That's why uh, we use the shockwave catheter to change the compliance of the vessel wall, to change the compliance of the plaque. And afterwards we are using oversized uh, plain uh, old balloon catheters to achieve uh, the uh, improved uh, lumina, uh, the, the maximum luminal gain. And after the uh, plain old balloon angioplasty, went for an IBUS run again to be sure that I don't have any significant recoil and then uh, perform a drug coated balloon angioplasty with a ranger 8 by 80 uh, just uh, to minimize the risk for stenosis because as you see, we have a focal lesion, uh, but um, the balloon angioplasty was, uh, angioplasty was at least 60. So uh, it's a uh, uh, recoil or restenosis might be an issue and using a uh, drug oil balloon treatment, we minimize the risk for restenosis. And the IVUS run confirmed uh, this uh, great angiographic result. Uh, even if you don't have IVUS in your cath line, it's very important to keep in mind that you have to perform uh, many different projections um, uh, just uh, to see if you have the, the best, uh, if you have any restenosis. And again, uh, we, do, we didn't have an issue uh, with distal embolization uh, or perforation, uh, which is uh, very important in these patients with CLTI and uh, very uh, bad uh, runoff. So, Lorenzo, I think you uh, it's uh, your case now. Exactly. Thank you, Costas, for uh, introducing the, the common femoral archer. I think it's a territory where uh, most of us are very interested to see if we can uh, come out uh, with solutions. And uh, one of the solutions, as I said, you know, it's uh, this. Uh, uh, shockwave, and actually, this case is very much similar to yours, so we'll go quickly through it. It's a profound femoral artery which was patent and a common femoral artery which was diseased. And you can see, even on the CT, how there was a lot of calcium. It's difficult to sometimes to get a single shot on CT, but you can see it very well now on the angiogram. Like it was a very focal but very tight stenosis, extremely calcified. And uh, you know, again, uh, I can't agree more with you. You know, we use the seven millimeter despite the vessel was bigger, so we use the seven millimeter to adhere to the uh, main uh, stenosis and then we use the 10 millimeter balloon which was the actually the, the right size to open the vessel you can see from the run that the vessel now is completely patent and i want even to show you even better like the you know the look of the pre and post uh, uh, shockwave and angioplasty how it looks essentially you can say okay fine we could have used a bigger balloon straight away but actually i think I can't demonstrate it really, but I know I, from my experience and from also the experience of other clinicians, that the result would have not been so clean. And we don't have also to think about IVL, as we said before in the poll, as only like a treatment option straight away. Sometimes the disease can be, uh, again, you know, another very calcified lesion, which was uh, uh, just a very tight stenosis. 
and it was uh, uh, the shockwave 7 mm was used to treat uh, the both uh, the common femoral and the profound femoral artery you can see the balloon uh, as a marker so the markers are where uh, the, the shock comes so it was very right the costas was saying uh, really uh, take care of uh, um, overlapping and it's essentially also to move the markers in the place where the, the most calcium is present. So you can see how the balloon opened uh, between one inflation and the other one. That means the balloon is working. The balloon is making the vessel more compliant to even low pressure balloon angioplasty. And essentially after, you know, even the balloon completely burst because I mean, it was a very uh, uh, calcified uh, lesion that we decided to go for another angioplasty. And because the calcium was still uh, a little bit affecting the vessel and the patient, uh, we need to uh, come out from uh, this uh, rest pain uh, with no, without putting the patient again on table, we decided to stand and we decided to position a supera stand. You can see here from my post deployment how the stand is completely nominal. So the, the length of the stand is exactly the same as the markers into the sheath. And you can see how the stand makes the vessel looking great. And actually the, the stand is completely and very well expanded. And it's even more evident in these two videos where I asked the patient to move his leg up and down, so to maximum flexion of the, of the hip. And you can see how the stand doesn't get squashed. And you can see even the same thing with the contrast injected, how the lumen stays patent without the stand being crashed by the calcium. And I think this is a, a very, very important point. So I would like you then to cause us to wrap up. Uh, sorry for the interruption. I think when we discussed about the cases, uh, we're discussing it, and I think it's important for, for all of us to discuss this case. Um, what, it, I, I, of course, the result is, is nice, but uh, why don't you go deeper to the profunda with the soap wave capture? I mean, uh, I think, think it, capture, yeah. No, I think it's interesting. It's uh, sometimes, you know, uh, I think it's still, uh, this was a one of, you know, very early cases which I've done. And sometimes you're a bit, uh, uh, um, scared you're a bit you know concerned about okay should i put a bigger balloon in a, in a smaller vessel but actually you know it's a very good question because and nowadays i change a little bit my attitude still i i use uh, bigger balloons for even you know seven millimeter for a six millimeter vessel very very uh, you know with no problem because you inflate this balloon at very low pressure so essentially you don't traumatize the vessel so much like with a normal balloon angioplasty and i think this is a very good important point and hopefully you know we're going to discuss even more during the, the the discussion it's important to size the vessel size the balloon to the vessel in order to touch the the walls and to crack the calcium properly yeah because but you know please uh, show us your case and come on then yeah i i i you know it's like uh it's it's the, it's the opposite it's not it's it's about not being very scared to go deep uh, deep in the profunda and as you see in this case we have a, a patient with end stage renal disease uh, he for sure uh, he had he had rest pain and for sure he wasn't the best uh, uh, the, the best patient for an open repair. So uh, as you see, uh, went down to the deep femoral uh, with the shockwave cutter. I, I used to, to be honest it was one of the first cases that I have done uh, growing cases. So I used a second guide wire to secure the SFA in case of a plaque swift uh, because as you see the proximal SFA also had a kind of disease. Uh, I crossed the profunda, uh, went for a shockwave balloon angioplasty, as you see, with a, a good angiographic result, uh, and then um, went for the SFA, uh, drug code balloon angioplasty uh, for both the SFA and the profunda. And uh, actually, after six months, you see the, M uh, the uh, MRI and uh, the profunda uh, is patent, but the SFA occluded. And um, th this is uh, just a reminder that if you have a, a profunda lesion, you want to go for endovascular disease, don't be as, don't be afraid to go for the proper lesions. Better to um, to go for an uh, for an oversized uh, shockwave catheter with a good overlap instead of uh, pseudo treating the vessel, which just increases the risk of complications and uh, probably uh, the patient will not uh, benefit. And I think this is a very uh, is a key point. Uh, we see so many difficult cases with heavily calcified disease, very um, uh, patients with increased comorbidity. And still, I think that uh, IVL can be a very uh, safe and effective uh, solution uh, for these uh, high risk uh, patients. So now we come to the next, to the, to the final poll, I think. Um, so uh, the, the final question is, 
does the avail- availability of IVL uh, change your thoughts about adopting an endovascular approach for calcified uh, common femoral lesions? And I would add also here uh, deep femoral lesions. Yes, uh, number one, or two, no, uh, this is a surgical uh, domain. And I will hand up uh, again to Lorenzo. Yeah, so I mean, we we have the the, the final comments on uh, on uh, what uh, what uh, we have seen uh, uh, during this presentation. I think that it's a, it's very important for uh, for uh, you uh, guys to vote and to share with us uh, your opinion because this is a, a also a way to to in, interact and to understand what most of the people would uh, would have done in uh, this uh, in this case. So I mean, just to wrap up the things, you know, this is the shockwave and then it's presented like uh, safe because as we have seen that you know data and also our experience uh, uh, reports uh, almost zero cases of uh, this embolization and it's intuitive because i mean everyone can do it it's just a balloon like another one you just need to press the button and even as i usually say even my daughter can do it and actually is effective because as we have seen it's a very uh, very uh, good uh, uh, results and uh, you know it can be applied in many different segments in many different ways so i mean uh, it's uh, now time to go uh, for the polls then it's uh, it's uh, important for us to know what you think and what we discussed so please can I have the first poll and the first poll was very simple. Do you use IVL in your daily practice? Is yes or no? And I'm very happy actually to see that 71% of the people are not using uh, IVL. There's a lot to discuss about uh, why don't you use IVL, uh, but it's important that we are trying to educate uh, new users uh, to uh, this uh, new technology. Uh, very quickly, you know, Ryan, why do you think that people mainly don't use IVL in their practice? I think there's been uh, I think there's obviously a cost barrier these days that everything we have to justify uh, in terms of expense and the device does co- does cost more than a plain angioplasty balloon. But I think this is going back. We've had this discussion before in CLI treatment, right? When we started bringing in drug eluting technologies, when we started bringing mimetic stents uh, that actually you may spend more money on the day, but if, you, if you're achieving limb salvage or if you're pushing out the patency of your recanalization for several more years, you're making that back that money. So as we saw cost benefit analysis appear for, for drug eluting technologies in the first few years after they came out, I think as, as the shockwave technology becomes more mature, we'll st- start to see similar cost benefit analyses coming out to show, um, to, to, to show the benefit of the technology and spending that money. Thank you. Yeah, I think it was very wise. And we've seen also other two cases of yours that where the patient came back because, you know, the first treatment was not yeah. effective. So it's a very good reason to uh, not only economically, but also in terms of limb salvage, not to lose time. Time is tissue. So let's have a look to the second poll then. Uh, how would you treat? This was the case which I have done with IVL. And uh, I can see that, uh, um, you know, 25% of the people would have used high pressure PTA, which is something that I was also using before. Uh, and then uh, uh, 42% uh, uh, IVL and 17% atelectin. How would you comment these uh, results, Costas? Uh, you know, what do you think, especially about high pressure PTA? I think it's a good option, but you know, w- what does it change with uh, with IVL in your experience? So, so the only first of all, in this case, uh, the reason why I think that IVL is uh, is an is a wise uh, choice is that the, first of all, the patient has a very calcified disease also in segments that you would like to avoid the stenting. And secondly, uh, in uh, the patient had a very bad runoff. So this combination, I think that um, uh, it's important to keep in mind that, as I said before, this patient needs an effective treatment, but a safe as well. So uh, about high pressure balloon, I think, of course, you, you can treat this lesion of high pressure balloon, uh, angioplasty, but afterwards, more or less, you will need a scaffold. Because I don't think that just uh, the use of high pressure PTA uh, can really uh, change the compliance of the vessel wall. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that if you perform also IVUS after this case, you will see many dissections that are not uh, angiographically present. Um, and um, and I, think, I think that, you, you know, you cannot just, at least in my, in my practice, I do not just use uh, any kind of PTA as standalone therapy. So I would go for a high pressure PTA, but afterwards, uh, probably I would need a scaffold. Well, in this case, how, how long should this scaffold be? I mean, from the P2 segment of the distal pleural artery up to the 100 channel, in, even, even uh, to the middle SFA. So I, I think that placing such a long scaffold in a, in a young patient, uh, it's not a reasonable option. Um, Great. 
Yeah, I, th I think it's it, you're very exhaustive, and you know it's a, it's important also to uh, understand that you know high pressure balloons, of course, some crack the calcium, but if you uh, then uh, crack so aggressively, then you you as you said very wisely, you need a, a, you have there's a need for standing. When you inflate the, the the IVL, essentially the vessel to the, the the vessel is not traumatized by the inflation. It just you know the the the, the pulses which break just the calcium, and, and actually it was this very fantastic slide that you know uh, which was presented uh, you know. Uh, many times with the calcium, with the anatomopathological uh, segment of artery where you can see the calcium, which is just cracked by uh, the IVL. So let's go for the next uh, uh, poll, then uh, the third one. And you see, uh, how do you see the main application of IVL in the FEMPOP segment? And actually, it's very interesting to see that most of the people think that uh, IVL plus DCB is uh, the way forward, and IVL as standalone, so with the, also with PTA and IVL plus stand, I think is a good, uh, uh, you know, uh, escape if you can't really get rid of uh, the stenosis. What do you think, Narayan? Very quickly. Yeah, I think I think we I would also agree with that that I, you'll try and avoid leaving nothing behind where you can, but for sure in my practice I've seen the IVL makes my stents look better even when i've gone to a bailout stent you don't end up like with a picture that costa showed where you've got a long fempop stent that's occluded that, that that's compressed a long way down it and there is literally nothing you can do to fix that so ivl is def if even if you need to stent if you've done ivl that's we think that that is going to improve the patency of your stent long term and it'll be very interesting to see the data from the uh, disrupt pad observational cohort about those patients that were stented and compare their patencies to um historical groups who've just had stents that may not be fully expanded. I'm very lo much looking forward to seeing that kind of data. Uh, Kostas, I have a question for you because it's coming from uh, one of the attendees, but uh, we don't have a lot of time, so we'll address it now. Uh, what do you think about the use of the uh, IVL in uh, subintimal or intraluminal recanalization? It's coming from uh, Vittorio Alberti from Italy. So. Um, so we don't have, I don't think that we have data uh, to support uh, my opinion. Uh, from my practice, I think that if you have an intimal uh, crossing, uh, the results are, bet are better because you have much more space for the calcium to expand. This is, is uh, logical, but it doesn't mean that uh, it doesn't work when you are in the subintimal space. Um, I, I use it also in subintimal space. For example, if you see these undergrade retrograde crossings, for sure you're in the subintimal space uh, in some uh, segments of the, of, of the lesion. Uh, and uh, it works as well. But um, if if I have to choose, then I would go for the for the uh, for a true lumen crossing, and then soak with uh, angioplasty. Great, I think it's a it's a great answer. Yeah, we we still have a lot of to understand, so it's a, that's a very exciting. So we are discussing about a technology that we understand, which is working, but we don't have still data. And you know, of course, the, it was very I think um, you know very nice that uh, Shockwave is doing this randomized control trial to try to you know to go through uh, some uh, proper scientific evidence and to go more in depth in what which is the potential actually of this technology. So let's have the new uh, the one of the last. Uh, just to comment on this, you know, uh, there, there are many concerns about the application in eccentric lesions, co-eccentric, and so on. Well, the data that we have, especially from the coronary, so that uh, it also works in eccentric lesions. Um, you don't, not only circumference and calcium. So I think that we need data for sure, but I wouldn't uh, say that I wouldn't use SOCWIF because the lesion is eccentric or because I'm in the subintimal space. I would have to, to see it, but of course, when you treat the challenging lesion, you're in the subintimal space, you have a long crossing, a long lesion calcified, uh, probably some no modality will, uh, will have 100% uh, success. I think if the lesion is very challenging, sometimes we, you will be successful, so quick, some not, but to be honest, um, in, this, in this kind of challenging cases, no uh, modality can be successful 100% of the cases. Of course, and it's good to have all the armamentarium probably on the shelves just to be able to choose whatever you need for, you know, at least whatever you think it's more uh, useful for this, the, you know, the single patient on table. So let's go for the next uh, poll. Uh, again, you know, there's a, a very nice uh, and simple question. Does the, does the availability of IVL change your thoughts on adopting an endovascular approach for calcified lesions? And actually, I'm, I'm happy that 82% of the people said yes. So that means, you know, in the probably in, in the new uh, trial Else, we need to include, I think, and this is again, sorry, a question for you, Costas. Again, I mean, I've seen, and it is also on Twitter a few weeks ago, 
we have seen that of course companies try to uh, you know uh, show uh, us the technology that they sell works and because it's normal in a kind of this kind of commercial setting but also it's important for us the clinicians to understand what's the best vessel preparation for to compare this data with, uh, uh, um, with of course, the, the, what you call the gold standard, which is open surgery. So what do you think is going to be the next very important, probably non-sponsored trial for the common femoral? I would, I would like to see a best, uh, a best common femoral artery trial, you know, uh, best endo versus best surgical. And, uh, and Ryan, you know, what, who do you think they should, uh, they should, be, should pay for this uh, trial, which I think should have at least five years you know, data, because if not, you're going to always stand up with the one year or two years data. Who do you think should pay, you know, internationally speaking? This is this is going to have to be something like an NIH, NIHR funded trial, because as you said, no company is going to put their put their money behind it. At the end of the day, as you, as Costas was saying, it's it's about best endovascular treatment. And I think with Shockwave, we're finally getting to a point where we can offer a best endovascular therapy. Now that we have Shockwave, now that we have DCB, now that we have mimetic stents, now what we can offer as best endo really is best endo uh, as opposed to before. So yeah, I think it's gonna it's gonna have to be uh, be be funded by a healthcare institute. Um, it's gonna take time. We thanks a lot uh, our two speakers, uh, Kostas Ravulakis and Narayan Tulazidazan. And also there's a little bit of homework for you guys uh, to do. You know, Narayan mentioned this paper for SMA and celiac trunk, so go and read it. And uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna take your emails and ask you uh, about comments uh, to this paper. No, it's very nice uh, always to learn uh, from everyone. You know, it's uh, this kind of uh, meetings uh, online are very helpful to connect all the community together. And I'm very proud today that we uh, passed a nice hour with two experts like Dr. Stravulakis and Dr. Tulazidazan. So essentially, I want to just to refresh your memory. Tuesday afternoon, it's Vascopedia time. See you next week, uh, 5.30 Central European time, 4.30 for me, uh, for Narayan in the uh, UK and, you know, and all the other different views is in, the, in the world. And uh, we thank you again for your attention and uh, see you next Tuesday. Bye.